All right, I've got 2.30 on the clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Start on time, right? Yeah. All right. <coughs> okay, I'm Noelle Yingling, and Raymond Jett, he was one of our main volunteers that were helping, although it was definitely a collective effort from everybody, even if you spent one hour to 100 plus hours at Computer Reset. So, um, this is the Computer Reset that you guys probably recognize, the ones that you saw once the liquidation started. But this is not where Computer Reset started. So there I was visiting one time, stuck my camera on my car and took a selfie. <laughs> so um, it all started with my dad. So he is the one that had the vision for Computer Reset. He was definitely a lifetime learner. He was born in Oklahoma City. He earned his engineering degree. He also got a JD degree so he could be a patent attorney. He worked for Dresser Industries, for um, Boeing, and for Arco. And as he started his career and all that, he realized the politics and the corporate life was not for him. So he, he did not like that lifestyle and how they dictated everything in his life. So he started his own path, which led him to Computer Reset. So our little family consisted of my dad, my mom, my sister, and obviously myself. So there were four of us. So he started with a dream to get away from the corporate life. And he started with a press release explaining what he was going to do with Computer Reset, starting with um, sales and consignments and starting at a, a local flea market in Garland. And we eventually evolved to a bigger building after starting the business in the house. So I can't tell you as a teenager how many times I woke up to the screech of packing tape in the washroom right behind my bedroom. As a 13 year old, I was not happy to be woken up before noon. <laughs> that was not cool. <laughs> so that's where the business started, basically with like one part-time employee, you know, packing boxes and shipping them out in the washroom. So we finally expanded past that after he was having a lot of, you know, for Saturday sales, we went down to San Antonio. He started doing um, BBS systems. Um, magazines, mail order, lots of things that as a teenager, I didn't really pay much attention to. I tried to avoid it, but I did go to a lot of his sales with him because our whole life consumed around computer reset. So in order for me to spend time with dad, that's where I went. So, um, and you know, it was all, it was all good. Now we started in a different location uh, than the computer reset. You know, there was a office warehouse that he rented just down the street from what you guys know is computer reset. Um, and we expanded through that, rented another warehouse in that same complex, filled both of those up, which for those of you that have been to computer reset is not a surprise. <laughs> he loved to fill every inch of it up. So every inch of that, those places were filled up. And then he bought what's known as a Hamilton Air Mart. And that is the computer reset that some of you guys have been to, others you've just seen online. If you haven't been there, you're going to get a good glimpse of what we did for the last three years. So when he bought the building, um, I was much older. And so I, you see that picture right there with all the plants and stuff in there. I worked to make that really nice in their lobby. Um, all those plants were since gone and one plant survived until Snowmageddon in Dallas, which like basically froze the whole city pipes frozen like everyone's houses everything was a disaster and the one remaining plant did not make it so that was we watered that plant for years hoping it would make it <laughs> so the building is a two-story building with a warehouse and a large outdoor lot uh, at one time he started a u-haul business and we separated it with some drywall for u-haul's regulations so he could run two businesses in that building and you can see in that picture, there's a lot of stuff starting to add up. He bought a lot of used equipment from businesses that were upgrading their computers, getting rid of their old stuff, schools that upgraded, businesses that closed, people that would just bring stuff by. Um, and it just multiplied very, very easily. Uh, if you look <laughs> at the bottom picture, that is what it looked like at its height of hoarding with the entire back lot full of computer stuff. And you might notice the billboard at the upper right of that lower picture. And you can see 
in the lot, in the back lot, all those computer pieces are covered with various tarps. Those are all billboards, the parts that they've taken down, the old advertisements, and Richard kept those and covered everything on the back lots. That's how he protected it, because the building was full. So, <laughs> so this, he continued all this until his accident. Um, this door that you're seeing right here, actually the spring broke and hit him in the head. And I did not find about the accident until a week after it happened. And my mom was trying to lift him up and hurt her back. So the neighbors called the paramedics and they, you know, took them to the hospital. From there, they went to rehab. And that's when everything just started to really hit me as to what I was about to have to take on. But even then, I didn't have a full glimpse as to what I was really getting involved with. So as everything was coming to a hit, and I was starting to see all this, my, my daily words were, what the? <laughs> and why is my phone blowing up? And why is my dad's phone blowing up? And it was just a mass chaos of everyone calling me from people talking about the business to what do I do with mom and dad? How do we take care of their care? I was learning about their house and that was a hoarding situation as well. So not only did I have to take care of the house, but I had to take care of the office. I still didn't have a full glimpse of it until I saw pictures and actually came to Dallas to see what the visual of walking through all this. Um, so the accident spread very, very quickly across the internet. My phone was blowing up. My dad's phone was blowing up. I discovered a YouTube video that was put online where somebody was actually trying to help us. But at the time I was not aware of that. So things were, people were coming in the building, buying things, taking things. And it was just really crazy. And so my phone was blowing up, dad was blowing up, and then there was someone called Bill. <sighs> Bill <laughs> thought he was helping. Bill was not helping. Bill had ulterior motives. So that's a whole presentation in itself. Um, but Bill was sent away and just after multiple threats and all sorts of stuff going on. So Bill was gone. So, and then this picture that you see there is of Justin. Justin is the one that started the YouTube video. Justin is the one that had me watching this 45 minute video twice that first night, fuming mad because he was letting people in the warehouse. What I did not know, he was a friend of my dad's, had known him since he was a teenager and was just trying to help. So as a internet search, I was searching for him. He was searching for me. We finally connected and, and got everything squared away. We talked for multiple hours, several days in a row and finally met. And Justin is the reason why we are all here today and Computer Reset, the story was written the way it was. So, because if it wasn't for him setting up a lot of stuff, we would not have started this liquidation. I was prepared to scrap everything in there because I didn't realize it was important to people. Yeah, all you so, knew was there was a lot of trash, there was a lot of e-waste, and it was gonna cost a fortune to empty a building. Right, and you can't walk around this building and it all has to go. And in my mind, not being the computer person, I was just, going, what do I do with this whole warehouse full of junk that nobody wants? And Justin told Justin taught me that I was wrong and I was very glad I was wrong <laughs> and that we were able to preserve everything. Literally everything in that building went to either collectors or scrap or there was no e-waste. There was nothing thrown away except for cardboard and old moldy software <laughs> that nobody wanted anyways. So we were able to fulfill my dad's wishes for all the computer stuff to go into the homes of collectors that will actually preserve and appreciate it. But it took a huge amount of work. So we created a Facebook group, Computer Reset Warehouse Liquidation. And then behind the scenes, there was one for the volunteers so that we could coordinate things that was happening <coughs> behind the scenes. Uh, by the time the meeting happened with Justin and Noel, LGR, everybody knows Clint, came in and had a video and Justin said, hey, hold off, don't release it yet. And he had already had it done and was ready to go. And so after Noel and Justin talked and Justin said, I'll create a group of volunteers and we'll work to get this inventory out in the hands of computer collectors everywhere and also out to museums. Uh, the video was published. And when the video was published, we went from a few hundred to several thousand people in the group in the matter of less than 90 days. It was chaotic. And it was just an explosion of people joining in. And, and all of us as admins were looking through, it's like, okay, 
who do we approve? Who do we not approve? Because we, you know, we put up questions for people to answer to make sure, you know, we're trying to keep the bots out and trying to, to, you know, maintain some kind of order to the chaos. And so the volunteer crew was assembled and the idea behind the volunteer uh, crew was to clean up and organize things, trying to get the warehouse into a safe space. If any of you have ever seen the LGR videos, you'll know that you would just have to turn sideways and shuffle down to the low at the lowest point of the piles coming down this side and the piles coming down that side. There was very rarely a space where you could see the concrete floor in there. And everybody that was there was handpicked by Justin. We had some kind of knowledge of vintage hardware, vintage software, vintage peripherals. You know, we had the knowledge to know what we were looking at and to, to determine, hey, this is important. This is something that we need to keep. This is something we need to divert to a museum. You know, this is something that's trash. And we had a lot of very patient spouses, boyfriends, and girlfriends. This project took three years and thousands of volunteer hours. So we're actually gonna make a, a, a thank you t-shirt for the spouses. <laughs> so the task at hand is to clean and organize a hoard. Three of those 40 yard dumpsters we filled with empty direct TV boxes alone. If I ever see another direct TV box in my lifetime, it will be too soon. <laughs> but you're not emotionally scarred by that at all. No, <laughs> none of us are, are we? <laughs> and we had to deal with mold, mildew, mushrooms. Yes, mushrooms. So there were Zenith boxes full of PC Junior keyboard cables. Because what we would do is they were sitting under a skylight and the water came down so much that the mold grew and it turned into mushrooms. And it was really interesting to see mushrooms growing on cardboard. And so we would rip out all the boxes, take all the cables out, toss them in a Zenith box, throw all the, the nasty stuff away. And then there were the rat droppings. There were rats, oh, it was a mess. Uh, all through the building, but you know, Richard had cats on lease from a lady that was in the area, and that helped to keep them down. But I mean, it was just, it was just mad. And the skylights, you know, it, it, when it rains, we'd have, we'd scoop stuff so that the water would come down and not land on everything. And so here you can see a picture through the warehouse. <laughs> there was no heat. No air conditioning. In the winter time, we layer up, which is fine. In the summertime in Texas, it was miserable. So when during the middle of COVID, when we were trying to get everything ready to go, we switched our hours to 7 a.m. to 1230. And then we would get out of there as, as everything was just getting miserable, too miserable to work. And there were three forklifts, but none of them worked. So it was all manual labor. There's no inventory of anything. So people are like, you know, what's there? We don't know. We could tell you that something's not there, that we, we don't think there's any more of something, but we're not gonna say absolutely for sure that there's not. And I'll get into that again here in a little bit. And then there was paperwork going back to day one. We took out from one of the offices, 25 contractor trash bags of paperwork alone going back to the mid eighties. And the mess went around the building. So it wasn't just in the outside lot. So you've got the building, you got the warehouse, you got the back lot, and then back around the side of the building is more. And if you notice on the right-hand side of the picture, you'll see something that uh, any Apple collectors in here, uh, you, you see the uh, Apple color composite monitors in there. Yeah, there were a bunch of those and they got uh, plucked out, powered on, and most of them still gave a raster. <laughs> one of them, I mean, they've been rained on for years. And so one of them went to uh, David Murray and he uh, restored it and, and recorded and posted a video about it. But uh, yeah, they, they were a mess, but they cleaned up nicely. Now the dumpsters. <laughs> all in all, we actually used 36 dumpsters. There was the, the very last one. Now to give you a, an idea of scale, most of this was 40 yard dumpsters. We removed over a thousand cubic yards of trash. So how big is a 40 yard dumpster? I drive on one hand an MX-5 Miata. On the other hand, an F-250 quad cab four x four pickup truck. I can drive that truck into the 40 yard dumpster, get out, close the door behind it, and you won't even see it sticking over top of the dumpster. That's how big these dumpsters are. 
And that is the tail of a Ford. Now we also had our dumpster monkeys. <laughs> David, my son was one of them. And we're, uh, we're thinking about making a dumpster monkey t-shirt for the five guys that did this. Uh, there were extra charges from the dumpster companies. You throw any e-waste in there, you got an extra charge. If it came up over top of the level of the dumpster, you got an extra charge. They didn't charge extra for the dumpster juice though. Oh my God, if you've ever had a dumpster brought in and they back it up with the truck and they tilt it to take it off and all that water runs out is the nastiest smelling stuff. It's disgusting. But because you couldn't have anything go over the top layer, we had dumpster monkeys. That's just our term for the guys. Hey, can you go up there and monkey that down? And they'd go up there and stomp and rearrange stuff and get it packed down to where we can get a little bit more in before the uh, truck arrives with the fresh dumpster. So we you know, try and get our, our best money's worth out of all of these. And then cool things kept turning up. So we created some merch. There was the dune buggy, the cameras, the mini bike, the fire plug typewriters, vacuum tubes, uh, just a tremendous amount of things. And so you'll see the computer reset shirt some folks are wearing that's got all these things going around. And those are all things that were found in the warehouse. And then we also found the computer uh, reset gazette newsletter. And in there was the Compusaurus. And so we took that and it was turned into a shirt. You can get it on shirts, you can get it on sweatshirts for a while off Amazon. And uh, we also did mouse pads. You know, we've, we've done public and volunteer shirts, uh, plus special ones at the end. Yeah, you'll notice that Kevin and Jean and Noel and I have a special shirt on that uh, was given to the volunteers that stayed all the way to the very end with a story on the back with every one of us that was there the last day mentioned. <coughs> and then we also had the, the mouse pads and you can see they took one of the mouse pads, the first one that we got back uh, in the mail over to Richard and gave it to him. Now we've been going through and doing a lot of work and this is all of the initial work, but we decided let's take a break. And we did, we went to Dallas Makerspace, reserved a room and had a DFW retro computer meetup, special edition with everything that people found at Computer Reset and had in their collection from Computer Reset. And Richard came over, they picked him up at the care facility and brought him over and he came in the room and he just lit up, he just smiled. And he stood around and, and just talked and talked and talked with folks. It was, it was great. He was the guest of honor there. And uh, everything that, that was there came from Reset. Uh, the only incident we had was Arifa. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know that term, that's the little uh, X2 safety caps on the 110 volt side. You know, when you get the old computer gear, uh, they like to go snap, crackle, pop, and fill the room with acrid smelling smoke. So it was a TRS-80 Model 4P, went sizzle, sizzle, crack, and started smoking. And then uh, once the smoke stopped, we turned it back on. <laughs> <laughs> and then we continued to clean up, and, and we turned up more things. Uh, Justin found an original Macintosh box, and then... Uh, uh, I believe it was you, David, found the, uh, the PC Junior, uh, the bumper sticker stuff, yeah. uh, all of the, the different phases the artwork went through before he finished up with the I Love My PC Junior bumper sticker that you could get from him. Now, us volunteers, we were paid with food. We didn't get, we didn't get paid. Uh, we even had to buy things that we found at Computer Reset. You know, we paid a reduced rate versus what everybody else did, but we still paid. You know, what the thing we got was food. And let me tell you how hard it is to find food vendors that don't screw up every order you do. We found Rick's Old Fashioned Burgers. Great, owned by a Korean family. They, they are awesome. And, and they, they all stood up and, and said, thank you very much and waved and gave us cupcakes uh, at the last time we were there. They, they were really sweet family. And then we found the, uh, the Takiera down the other way. So you go down to Plano Road, hang a right, there's Rick's, you go up, hang a left, and then you go up to the Takiera. So we had Mexican street tacos. And those were the only two places that we found, Saturday Rick's, Sunday tacos, where they didn't consistently screw our orders up. <laughs> so it was nice, you know, they, we got to know the owners and uh, they, they gave us really great treatment there because we were very repeat customers. Now, as we were doing all of this work in the warehouse, we had to make pockets here and there. So we clean up this area, 
move stuff over here. Now we got to clean up this area, move stuff over here. So it was, it was a constant shuffling of trying to get the things uh, into place. So we were disassembling and assembling things all at once. And we had Mount Backwall, which is what we called the very back wall of the warehouse. You can see Chris on top of Mount Backwall back there in that picture. And uh, we had Fort Andy going up in the middle pallet rack section where he put up all of these uh, barriers so that we could stack monitors up there, dead ones, and not have to worry about them falling down on people. It was a lot of work, but how do you eat an elephant? Can anybody tell me? One bite at a time. One bite at a time, absolutely. And that's what we had to do. And it, it took us three years to go through and do all of this. So we cleaned an area and moved the trash to the dumpster and just kept going around and around and around into, into different areas. Now, there came a time when we had to open the door. We did not want to open. That was the one that, that injured Richard and led to his death. But we had to clean out that area. And to get to it from inside, you had to go down the long hallway that was filled with monitors, go to the double doors, open them up, step in, because two and a half feet in front of you was a wall. Turn to the left, there's a section of, of uh, sheetrock that was missing. So you go in there and you look to your right, there's a little door and you open it and those are the stairs, um, underneath the stairs that were over on the U-Haul side. And you would go, you're basically going under the stairs through an opening in the sheetrock and then you come to this room that was filled full of compact and other boxed spare parts assemblies. And through that room, you had to go to the other side of the room to reach the light switch and then out to this garage bay. So since we had to go through that to get to it, we called that area Narnia. <laughs> and so it took three of us to lift that door. And once we got it lifted up, we took a, a forklift pallet extension, uh, a fork extension and, and shoved it up underneath it to hold it open. And in there we found printers and a whole pallet of PS2 Model 80s, another pallet full of uh, Vartad 46 motherboards and spool upon spool upon spool upon spool of cables. But we did get that area all cleaned out. And that's what the area we used for staging for things that were gonna go to museums. And now we tried our best to be as safe as we could and we built safety into the rules, but we still weren't 100% accident free. Uh, Jonathan, the son of one of the other volunteers, and Jonathan was a volunteer himself. He was one of our pallet monkeys. These are the people that would climb all the way to the top and get stuff down for everybody. Because we said, you know, nobody goes on ladder. Nobody climbs any pallet racking except a volunteer. We did not want any in injuries. My son was one of the others that did a lot of climbing. Uh, Jonathan was at the top of the back of the middle row of pallet racks. And you can see that pallet sticking over the edge of that beam. He stepped over to the edge of the pallet and the pallet went Phew. and you know he's what, was 15 at the time lands on his feet like <laughs> looking like what just happened <laughs> you know how your cat falls from the top of the shelf and looks like what was that that was a look on his face he just pallet surfed all the way down and then the other one you can see a server here at the top of the rack. Next to it is a SCSI scanner. And on top of that SCSI scanner is a wrapped uh, bundle of SCSI cable and power cable for that scanner. So somebody took that server and set it on top of the scanner and it was laying cockeyed up there. And I walk by and as I walk by, that thing falls down and I feel the brush of the, of it, the back of my head and it goes pow to the floor behind me. Okay, new rule. <laughs> if you're going to unstack something, stack it back, do it safely. Safety begins with you. Now, while nobody died through this, a deck VT420 did die with a funny hunk when it hit face down and the CRT imploded. Now, I had to put this in. <laughs> Falling off a pallet rack when you're a kid, he's like, hey, I'm okay. <laughs> But me being, you know, in my early 50s, sleeping weird position, it's like I'm laid up for days. <laughs> yeah. And then things shut down. We hit COVID. Now, everybody knows that when COVID hit, there's a different rules everywhere. Well, in Dallas County, they shut things down and you had to have a limited number of people in a building, depending on the square footage of the building. 
And then Justin was locked down by his employer. He worked for a company that provided cloud services for uh, global Fortune 100s. So he's kind of crucial to the economy. So they locked him down. They, they paid him to stay locked down. And so he was the key holder locally in Dallas. And so after a few weeks, uh, he and Noel talked and they asked me and I took a key and, and uh, started opening the doors and coordinated with the volunteers to continue everything. And we were already masked up because let's face it, the air in there was not good with all the mold, the mildew, the rats and everything. So we just kept going. And then about six weeks later, I call up Noel and I say, hey, I think we're ready to open. What'd you say back to me on that I was one? like, are you kidding me? <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> I no, sent her pictures. I never imagined. <laughs> <laughs> I sent her pictures and she's like, damn. <laughs> I was very impressed. Because <laughs> we, we worked hard. That was all through the summer when we were working from 7 a.m. to 1230 and leaving at 1230. And it's like, yeah, does anybody want lunch? <laughs> oh, I'm about dead. Anybody want to go to lunch? I mean, if you want to, we'll go. And they're, they're, everybody's like, no, I just want to go home. <laughs> And so we had to figure out how we could open and figure out a way to do it that would work within the framework of what Dallas County uh, put in place. So Kevin, another one of our volunteers here, created a website and uh, used the Azure free tier and the Facebook APIs linked it up with membership in the group. And so that we could register people and get people in the doors. And part of that was they also had to look at the rules and agree to the rules. And some of this caused a little bit of controversy in the group with the FOMO crowd, the fear of missing out in that we opened it up to locals in DFW first because we're testing this website and we're testing the registration. We're trying to make sure everything works and getting all of our procedures done and baked so that we can start inviting everybody else in. But also one other trick that was kind of a, a pain was that we had to rely on seven day forecasts. Nobody wanted to be in that building when the thunder, the lightning hit, when bad storms were coming through. So we had to rely on the seven to 10 day forecast to know if we we're gonna be available that we can you know, open for somebody to come in. So it kind of made it hard on folks that wanted to plan far in advance, other than we would say, you can book it, just make sure you get a, a refundable ticket for your plane so that you can bump it out another week. You know, that was, that was about all we could do. Now we did control the data on this and, and which was nice because you know we figured that if city of Dallas wanted to do contact tracing, we would say, okay, we've got the data. But if somebody else said, we want to know who's, who's been there, we would be like, screw you, get a warrant. <laughs> I mean, this is Texas. You know, we, we need to protect people to the degree that we can. And we did have a lot of fun. Some of it was brainstorming, you know, it's like, what do we do with all the smalls? So there was, AC adapters and keyboard adapters and mouse adapters and serial adapters and hard drive rails and screws, nuts, bolts, uh, and pallets upon pallets upon pallets of 128K memory cards for the PC convertible, more than I think were ever, they ever made PC convertibles to use. <laughs> and so there was a huge stack of Radio Shack surprise boxes on one of the upper decks in the, in the uh, warehouse. We grabbed those down, assembled the boxes, started packing with things. And one of the things we found, we found about, oh, 16 or 18 packs of Mopar piston rings. <laughs> we put those in a bunch too. <laughs> so they were surprise boxes. And we did have our pranks. So what happens when somebody that Justin knows brings a U-Haul over and leaves it overnight and we find it Saturday morning? We put a pallet of PC convertible AC power supplies in it for them. <laughs> for the record, we had probably 18 pallets of PC convertible power supplies. Yes. That was the 15 volt 2.7 amp switching bricks that were big. And you know, some of the other things we did, uh, David listed the hydraulic press and that was being held for Justin as sold and told Justin we sold it for 50 bucks. <laughs> And then he took his Apple IIe and Model M from home and put it in one of the dumpster pictures that was posted online in the group. And people were like, oh my God, there's a Model M in there. <laughs> and then uh, I took uh, a bottle of water and poured some of it on his car tire. And, and, uh, and Pete, another volunteer goes, hey, David, somebody took a leak on your car tire. <laughs> 
Uh, and then, you know, doing things like smart aleck answers to, to dumb questions like, yeah, it's over there by the crate of Apple Ones. <laughs> But overall, we, we try to be as helpful as we could. You know, if somebody come up and, and picked up a uh, my Okie Data Microline 320 printer, for example, and set it on their pile, we would go over and we'd say, hey, do you need tractor paper for it? We've got it over here on the U-Haul side, we've got it in boxes. Or I would go into the parts room and grab a serial port for it and uh, printer ribbons for it and go out and I'd just set it on top of the pile. We all did that, you know, just, we're all crack pushers. You know, we're trying to get this stuff out of the warehouse. So it's like, you know, anything that we can do to add to the piles, yeah, you know, we did. <laughs> and things are were flying out the door. And we did have some instances where your eyes are bigger than your stomach come to mind, where people didn't quite get everything fit in their cars. And some instances we had them pull stuff out so that we could help them Tetris it back in properly. And so, you know, this is one of the vans that was starting to be Tetris. And you can see how well we've got it packed all the way yeah. to the roof. And then we did that all the way to the back door in this instance. And, you know, we, we had to be careful, though, not to fill that last spot. <laughs> <laughs> there by the place Tetris knows you fit that last spot, it disappears. <laughs> now, we weren't without other problems. So the city of Dallas was on Richard to try and get everything cleaned up. And that was another unknown until they tracked down that Noel was paying some water bills yeah. <laughs> and then said, hey, we need to talk. And so there was a list of things to be done, you know, put in fire extinguishers, fix all the exit lights, clean up the front, fix the carport, clean the e-way stuff out back, board up the windows, paint the parking lot, paint the building, uh, see, replace ceiling tiles. There were a lot of things there that had to be done. But the, the nice part about COVID-19 was we would just keep them updated on where we were. And then after that, they were like, OK, we're good. We're, we're, we're closing this. And we we're like, oh, now, needless to say, we did not replace all of the ceiling tiles because when it rains, it, they just come back down. So that was another one of the rules. No picture taking, no filming without explicit approval. And part of the conditions of approval are we don't want any pictures or video of ceiling tiles. <laughs> so we wanted to stay off the city's radar. But that wasn't all of it. We had our share of break-ins and problems. The front door was crowbarred in 2019, and they took stupid stuff like little costume jewelry and stuff, and some PC Junior motherboards. They were looking for stuff for gold scrap. The trailer was broken into in June of 2020. Oh, and the front door, for those of you that have been there, remember, we would had all these little latches, you know, slide over to, to lock. We had like nine of them on the door all the way down. So that made it difficult for somebody to try and crowbar it again. But that was also when uh, we started putting up plywood on everything. Uh, somebody pulled down some rotted plywood, broke in, stole some more stupid items. Uh, the gate was dismantled at the back. This is the big sliding gate we had opened for the dumpster to come in. And that was the one that uh, we had to put two other padlocks and chains around because we didn't know this until we got there in the cell phone tower company because there's a cell phone tower on the lot and they had access through the front gate brought a truck on site and they just lifted the gate up off the rails and opened it wide and drove the truck in it's like wait a minute that's not right so we had to secure the gate further for that and that made them mad. So they locked us out one day. So I called up their 800 number and said, uh, can you give me the combination to this lock? Because I'm the owner's representative and you locked us out. And so I'm either going to cut the lock or you're going to give me the combination so I can reset this. So the locks are through each other properly so that we can get in and out and you can get in and out. They gave me the combination. I fixed it. Then March of 2022, that's when the big break-in happened where they stole a bunch of the rare items like the executive workstations and a few other things, uh, VT100 terminal, uh, including uh, a keyboard. Um, and then May of 2022, when they broke in and stripped a bunch of copper out from the AC systems on the roof and took the breakers and a bunch of copper out of the breaker panels. And we were left without power for the last month. Thankfully, Andy came in and he had a generator and that helped us at least run some lights and run the big five foot fan in the warehouse so that we could keep cool 
And then June of 2022, they clipped the circle pieces that go around the pole that holds the fence in. So we had to go to Lowe's and buy some more and then grab some ratchet straps, put them on the fence and uh, pull the fence over so that we could get it strapped back to the pole. Now there was a lot of transportation, a computer reset. People knew about the mini bike. They knew about the, uh, uh, the trailer that was outside and, and to an extent the dune buggy. But we found other things there like the box fan and it was more than just vehicles. We found a lot of technical drawings and documentation to aircraft and those went up to a museum in the Pacific Northwest. And so some of these other items that were found did go out to the museums. There was a Chevy two that was there. It was underneath multiple tarps and multiple layers of computer gear that was just sitting out in the elements. And then of course, a lot of people knew about the yellow dune buggy. There was a lot of folks like, hey, how do I buy it? So Noel was taking offers and uh, one of the uh, volunteers offered her more than everybody else on the internet. So she's like, okay, sold. And then of course, that we found some airline seats. Now those Kevin has, he's getting them recovered as we speak in the uh, flag colors of the original airline he went to go work for before uh, moving here to Dallas. My hometown airline, I was too young to work there. Oh, excuse me, his hometown airline. <laughs> yeah. And what was that airline? PSA. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> Except for the cart with the dead rats. <laughs> Bring out your dead. <laughs> All right, now we did partner in the cleanup. We couldn't have done all this by ourselves. I mean, we moved a mountain inside that warehouse and inside the buildings, but we did have scrappers that helped us out tremendously. Ray and Albany were two of the scrappers that benefited and worked with us the most. They helped clean up the whole outside. They took truckload after truckload after truckload of dead monitors, circuit boards and cables and all kinds of stuff. They sold it for scrap. They sold it to places that paid by the pound for it for based on what it was that they brought in and they made money. We were happy because it didn't cost anything to us, to, to Noel, to get that stuff out into an e-waste company. So it was ethically disposed of. They made money, they were able to buy a new truck. The, the van that you saw, the, the, the truck in the previous picture was a carrot for them when they were uh, uh, cleaning off the back lot when they were done, they could take that away for scrap. There was also a very large diesel engine block that weighed hundreds of pounds that was back there that they got at the end of that cleanup too. Now Richard had a great eye for marketing materials. Mm -hmm. And like the prototypes that he had, you know, the marketing materials are things that museums want. These are ephemerized. These are items that nobody kept. You know, people had them, they got them as swag at a trade show and they would just throw them away when they got home. But he kept these kinds of items. And some of these, these that you see on the screen here are at the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas on display. Uh, I don't think they have the buttons or the <coughs> PC one out yet, but the junior one is in the old store and the puzzle along with a postcard is in the uh, display case, the glassed in case with the PC junior on the floor. And they weren't the only ones. The Home Computer Museum in the Netherlands was a recipient of one of the executive workstations. IBM Museum got another one of those. Now we think that this was created by a third party company uh, for something like a nursing station, something along those lines. Uh, there were no hard drives in it. It was just a 720K floppy. So it's something that could be used as a, as a kind of a dumb terminal, uh, something that was looked sleek and nice on the desk. Uh, they came with black and white or color monitors by Sony. They used pan head screws. They used screws that IBM never used on anything else that we've ever seen. And so that's why that leads us to think that it was a third party creation for IBM. Uh, they were with Model 30 plane or Model 30 circuit board uh, with the MCGA graphics. And those of you that have seen the uh, video from the 8-bit guy where he, the infamous paperclip, the second one of those is at the, the Home Computer Museum. David has the uh, paper clipped one at, at uh, home in his collection. The paper clip, actually, the power supply in that does not power, the power switch does not turn on the computer. And there's only one power switch, it's on the side of the monitor. So when you look at uh, the video from uh, David, the paper clip actually is going between line and neutral that was going to the monitor. And that's why the fuse blew. 
So what it has, it has a little circuit board in there that monitors power draw to the monitor. So when you turn on the monitor, it sees that power inrush and it turns on two little uh, solid state relays that turn on the line in neutral to the power supply in the computer to turn the computer on. So it's kind of a, of a weird, weird power supply situation. So you turn on the monitor and it turns on the computer? Automatically. There's no power switch on the computer anywhere. It's on the side of the monitor. And there are a lot of other museums that benefited from computer reset. Uh, one of those was great. The uh, TWA Museum in Kansas City got a Umatic tape deck. And we were trying to figure out for two months how to get that up to them. And somebody came down that lived in central Kansas and he, he's like, I can take it back up with me. I'm gonna go see family over Christmas. And they're in Kansas City. So we contacted the museum, put those two in touch with each other. And, and it went up with, a person that came down to shop and, and got taken over to the museum. That was great. Museum of Flight is the one that got the technical drawings. Uh, the Vintage Computer Federation Museum, I sent them a, a Xerox and a, a deck mouse. Uh, the System Source Bloop Museum, MagFest Museum, uh, as well as the Total DOS Collection received a lot of different things from here. And you can see a portion of some of these museum items, the software and hardware, there's a rack there and other things that were delivered. And you can see a lot of common Dells and you might think, why would a museum want these common Dells? They're great for running interactive displays. You, know, you can set them up and run a software program on them, put stuff on the screen, take key inputs, whatever. You know, they're great for that. They're, they're kind of disposable computers. It breaks, okay put the next one up and get it running, get the museum, get the display back up and going. And also nonprofits got involved. So we had six trips to Goodwill with picture frames that Noel took. That was a lot of work in the, in the summertime. But after that, we ended up with an artist collective that came in and said, we'll take all you got. And we'll take all the glass too. And so they got all of that. It was two U-Haul trucks and a car load full. And then 30 plus HP laptops went to another nonprofit that refurbished them to distribute out to other nonprofits to use for computing. Uh, Free Geek from Minneapolis came down and brought two 26 foot U-Haul trailers and took all the rest of the PCs, most of the monitors, cables, expansion units, uh, all kinds of things from the warehouse and, and the store. We also had somebody that came down from Chicago that uh, took a huge number of monitors in another 24 or 26 foot truck that they were recycling the glass down into a glaze for industrial use ceramic like tiles. So that was great. I got a lot of monitors out that would have to go to e-waste. And then we started winding things down. At the beginning of the, of the calendar year, we switched to all you can eat pricing. Come in, it's like 150 bucks, load up whatever you want. And then all the e-bears came back again to load up some more. And we love that. What, what did you great. say about that? Oh, it was wonderful. It was just the way to clear it out. So, because we were all tired and ready to be done. So it was the best thing. And none of us volunteers wanted to, wanted to risk our own personal PayPal to ship something that's brittle plastic off to somebody and have them open it up and, and see shards of plastic and buyer's remorse and chargebacks and everything. You know, the eBayers wanting to come in was great. You know, if they want to make money, that's awesome. There's so many people that came through bought a lot for their collection and took more so they could take it back and sell to help fund their trips. We didn't mind because that got stuff out into the field, into the hands of other people that could never have been able to make the trip down to Dallas to visit Computer Reset. And then we went ahead and invited LGR to come back out to do a follow-up to his video to show everybody where we were at the time and, the, and to explain that, hey, this is the, these are the final days. We're winding it all down. David Murray came out and put his replica Apple One in a box as a bit of a troll in that video. <laughs> and uh, they both were gracious and, and signed autographs for folks that came out that day. And then the last PC Junior went home. We had a gentleman come in from Sweden and uh, he was the only person that came in from out of the country. Everybody signed the, the computer. All the volunteers that were there signed it. And then he went by and visited the 8-Bit Studio and got David Murray's signature on it. And we truly, truly thought that was the last PC Junior in there. And as we were getting to the end, we were cleaning up the final bits in the warehouse. And we had some folks that shopped there. We called them our frequent flyers. There's the folks that came you know, more than 10 times. If we had an opening because somebody canceled, we had last minute openings, we'd contact folks in the Dallas area and say, hey, anybody wanna come? 
And these guys would always say, yeah. And one of them was Sergio, who uh, did a lot of shopping for folks out in the field and uh, would ship a lot of stuff out. Uh, another one was uh, Jose Darris. And Jose came in and moved a couple of printers and promptly found two more PC Juniors. <laughs> <laughs> and so June 18th, 2022, we filled our last dumpster. We had that back, the front corner of the warehouse by the nasty bathroom. And I just took a rake, a garden rake, and I was just pulling stuff out, tossing it down to the floor. And folks were taking that and shoveling it up into carts and putting it in, getting it out to the dumpster. And we finished that up. And that was the last little bit of it. We had our last lunch uh, as a volunteer group at Rick's Old Fashioned Burgers. They gave us uh, cupcakes and, and uh, everybody came up and, and uh, was saying goodbyes to us there. And June 27th, the building went on the market and it's on the market currently uh, taking offers. We went from a huge hoard, a massive amount of cardboard, just avalanches of stuff coming off of the pallet racks down to where you had no, literally no room to step on concrete as you went through to an absolutely empty warehouse. Three years. And I'd like to thank a lot of people who provided pictures. So that's a story of computer reset. And that's the, the three year effort that we took as a volunteer crew to go through and empty everything out and get the building ready for sale. There are a lot of folks out there that have benefited from it for their collection. Uh, we priced everything, you know, people are like, what's the pricing? It's like, dude, just build a pile. We had somebody come out and said, ah, I got 200 bucks in my pocket. And I looked at the pile and I said, well, keep on adding. <laughs> and then he was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, keep going. <laughs> it's, I would say that the, you have eBay, you have brother-in-law. We were just above brother-in-law. And we had folks that came down. One lady brought her son who was 12 years old and into retro computer collecting from the Pacific Northwest, from Oregon down to Dallas. And we had fun, you know, when, when we had uh, some special visitors come in, if we had extra, you know, if we were going out like on Sunday to go to uh, tacos, I'd, I'd get a few extra tacos and we, we would share tacos with people, you know. We had a lot of fun and my wife, she was questioning, why are we doing this? You know, and my son, he said, I found my tribe. You know, for us volunteers going through all the COVID lockdowns, this kept us sane. You know, this gave us something to do outside of the house, something we could go out and just have fun, dig, explore, meet people, you know, do something. And it was, it was great. Now we're all trying to readjust to normal life and having our Saturdays back. <laughs> and with that, uh, anything you want to add? It was just a great collective experience because I had no idea how I was going to handle this from a thousand miles away. I live in South Carolina. That's in Dallas. It's a thousand dollar, a thousand miles door to door. What am I going to do? Single mom with three kids. So everyone that helped was an absolute blessing. And we had a great time doing it. And I would not have changed, as difficult as the process it was, I would not have changed a thing because we fulfilled my dad's wishes. The bonds, the experiences, the friendships that we have made will last a lifetime. This is what I consider my extended family. And it's, it's absolutely amazing that people could give so many hours, so much time, dedication, time away from family, friends, their own life to help preserve all this computer stuff. So that was the goal that my dad wanted to accomplish. And with all the help of the volunteers, we did it. We and absolutely did it. And I am forever, thank forever thankful. And for everybody that came out and shopped and brought all that huge energy of, oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> we fed off that and that helped us to keep going. And part of the, the rules thing, we would ask if anybody was first timers and we would chuckle and laugh and, and we'd say, oh, <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> Here, let me tell you something. You go in there, 30 minutes, you're gonna melt down. Everybody does it. So you just have to close your eyes, take a deep breath, let out slowly and refocus. Remember what you're looking for and ask a volunteer if, and, and we'll tell you if we've seen it, it was like, yeah, I think there's some of that still over here. And we'll help you find what you're looking for for your collection. 
And I, I can't tell you, how many of you uh, here have been to Computer Reset? How many of you have melted down at the 30 minute mark? <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the last slide I have. And we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. And thank you everybody for your, your time and attendance. Yes, sir. Oh, we didn't count them going out the door. There were pallets of new ones. And a lot of that went in early, early in the feeding frenzy to Tanner Electronics. Jim Tanner came and got it. And he sold a whole setup for like 75 bucks. He was selling them cheap and just blowing them out the door of his business. And that was another part of how a lot of new collectors came into the community because people would come in and they would see them. They would buy them for their kids and get their kids interested in retro computing. And next thing you know, you see them coming into the DFW retro computing group meetups. And you were next? Yeah, uh, if this accident had to happen to your father, would this repeat it? Would this just basically 20 years later, the same thing would have happened? Or do you think it would have been different? He was already starting to show signs of dementia. Okay. And so a lot, not a lot of people were coming into the building. So it probably would have just sat there. So. But eventually you would have had to do the same thing. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. It just happened that we had uh, a group of people that were aware of the situation from the other side and uh, Justin pushing to uh, try and you know, save the, everything from going to <coughs> the dump. Yeah. Because I had no idea what it was. And I, I had no idea did. people appreciated it. Yeah. So, um, but yes, I would have done it in 20 years from now. <laughs> it was not going anywhere. <laughs> um, I think probably would say, so I think I'll just preface this by saying I, I, had, no, I, I had no idea what computer reset was before I came in. So I just remember really it's an amazing story. I have to say that first off, but I think, um, so I think probably the first thing is what was the most, so I have a couple questions. The first one, what was the most valuable item that Oh, there were so many things that it was hard to put prices on. Uh, there were prototypes for the next version of the PC Junior that was never released. Uh, prototypes of the 101 key keyboard, the chiclet keyboard for the Junior. Uh, I ended up in my collection with the 10 meg hard drive expansion unit from IBM for that. And, it, and it's it's got a memory card that's in it that's a lot like what's in the, the Junior, the JX, the Japanese version. But it had pins bent out and flying wires going down to where you could see where they've gone in and, and actually hand done the memory card. Uh, there, were, there were old, old things like uh, VT100 terminals that were used as process machine control things that had a special keyboard with just a few buttons on them. Uh, there were, uh, Kevin, guys think of anything? I hate to say it all blends together after after three years of this. It does. It, it really does. So uh, for me, because I my first trip was at the very end of the free for all days. Uh, the thing that I, in my collection I consider most valuable is the brand new in service box next cube motherboard, which needs a recount because oh. it's an old next. The mindset systems that were real early. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's the Apollo. Yeah, 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 and then there was a, uh, a high res, uh, third party high res graphics terminal for CADM Katia design work <coughs> that was found. Um, and I think the other question I had was what kind of got into that was what was kind of shocking or really memorable items that you found? Rat turds. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you clean up, you evict them from one area, you come back um, a couple of months later and you move a pallet and they're back. Man, yeah. Uh, how many IBM 300 GLs put into a room? <laughs> we had a room on the U-Haul side we called Jay's room because Jay, one of our volunteers, stacked all the IBM 300 GLs in there and it went from the corner, back corner of the room to just enough to open the door and it was stacked up about five and a half foot high. Just enough that I could stand on my tiptoes and look over top of it. They, they had come out of a uh, apparently a, a refresh of computers at uh, like Voight. Yeah, Voight. Or Elf, LTV. Yeah, Voight. LTV tags. 
a few of them were from TechStot. Yeah. Uh, Hard Rock Cafe. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, all the all the uh, keypads from TGI Fridays. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, the grease covered ones. Yeah, the grease -covered ones. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so back there. Two, just because you were talking about you know, where some of this stuff came from and being in that area, do you have any of it was like from Enron? Uh, did not see any asset tags from Enron. We saw a lot of asset tags from every from all kinds of other places, including Lockheed Martin, but didn't see any Enron. See, it seems like it would add up, though, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and a lot of what was in there basically stopped around the year 2000 with the Y2K purchase. Oh, okay. And by that point, Enron, of course, was Houston, which was its own market. Yeah. So you think there was you know, that stuff probably most of, into its own area? Most of what was coming in there was from Dallas based companies. Just from Dallas, okay. And now how old are we going to look? In the early days, a lot of the IBM and Compaq stuff came from Houston and Boca Raton, Florida, where IBM had their Skunks Works. And uh, you know, we the the junior that I got with the uh, external ten or the ten meg hard drive stacker from IBM was labeled on the side as uh, Boca Raton Schools. So it was actually one they put in the school district to uh, to you know, heat soak. Wow. Well, this is a crazy story and it's fascinating. Has anybody approached you about like making a documentary uh, based on this? Anything along those lines? Many times, and I'm not sure that any of us are interested in doing that. Yeah. Because it's been a long three years and it's been very well documented on the internet. So um, I think we're done and ready for a break. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're still adjusting to having a real life now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing for people to talk about on the internet, but again, this is a niche, it's a niche thing. Mm -hmm. And outside YouTube videos, I don't see like being a Netflix local documentary. As I, I will say that I've been involved with just the festival circuit of, of short films and, and documentaries and independent films for a very long time. You'd be amazed how well these kind of stories do because it is that universal spirit with a very niche wrapper on top that people love those kind of stories. Things that you would never think about, you would never connect to. The human element is what you kind of latch on to. So understandable that it's you're ready to be done. Right. And there, like I said, there's plenty of uh, documentation that exists. Right. Maybe if we get reapproached in five years or so and we yeah. time to detox a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's gonna take a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to mention, so thank you for coming out. We, we actually, John and I drove 11 hours from here to visit you guys, and that's where I met uh, Will. She was actually out there visiting when we came out. Um, and we had a great time. It was fun. It was fun to see the actual thing, so we can say that you experienced it before. <laughs> Just, just for a short time. Uh, John has brought out, and are they in our consignment area? What's that? The laptops? Uh, I've got one on my desk. Yeah. He's got some laptops that he's refurbished from that. If somebody wants to get one, would you be willing to sign it for them? Yes. Sure. Okay. All of us would. We've got uh, David, okay. Kevin, and Gene here. Okay. So just want to mention that because we've got, yeah, we went up to the U-Haul place and found Toshiba parts. And John is a big <laughs> Toshiba laptop repairer. We did during COVID, sent out a whole number of laptops that came in that we picked up through our club, and kids needed them for doing the class, you know, because it was all remote education. And I know we did probably, you did probably a dozen or more, and we put them on next door. So he got expert, expertized in took sheet repair. So to give you an idea, I have 25 two by two by two, foot by two foot by two foot boxes in my garage of Toshiba parts that I got thanks to a gentleman named Andy who's not here. And I've used these to basically fix uh, all these Toshiba laptops. So I've got four of them. Follow me if you want. <laughs> Please. <laughs> we had a room in U-Haul which was just Toshiba parts. Yeah, we, so. we, we spent a lot of time up there. Because I brought the truck and John decided he was going to fill the truck because I thought I'm just going to put some stuff, and I try to be a little selective because I knew ahead of time how overwhelming. And I said, I have PC Junior stuff, so I, I went and went to PC. I was like, oh, you got that? Oh, volunteers were very helpful getting me a full set of parts. I could build two or three now, more PC Junior, so fine, it has problems. I'm covered with spares. 
Uh, and then we ended up in the Toshiba part, and he just kind of filled the back of my truck with uh, the Tetris. We Tetris in a few uh, boxes of Tetris and stuff. So thank you for that. And then after Andy drove from Dallas to Atlanta, there was more stuff <laughs> that was found. So the volunteers put a lot of the extra Toshiba parts in what I was going to take when I got the pods unit, shipped it from Dallas to Columbia, and John only being three and a half hours away, drove, once I got the pods back in Columbia, <laughs> drove to my house and picked up the rest of the parts. So it really was a, like, what, yeah, what's that? I said, if you need a Toshiba part, John. <laughs> He's got everything that was in that warehouse. <laughs> And so Andy did a lot of driving. He has a, a house up in Virginia, so he loaded up his truck and uh, stopped by and dropped off a whole bunch of stuff at the Blue Museum. And uh, just, you know, he would just take things along the way. Said, yeah, I'm going to stop off at so and so. I was like, cool. <laughs> All right, is that it? Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.